So we're in the second week of a sermon series titled Godly Character, and the reason I'm preaching on this topic is simple. This is the topic that we're teaching to our kids. You see, in most churches on most Sundays, including this church, there's often a disconnect between what is taught to the adults and what's taught to the kids. We just teach on different topics. And so we thought, what would it look like if we actually just took the kids' curriculum and started there and adapted it for adults? Because we want to be connected with our kids. Because we believe that a a strong connection with the adults of the church is one of the primary ways that our kids will develop a connection with their Father in Heaven who loves them. And so we're taking a kid's curriculum, but I had to make a few alterations because you're not kids. And the first alteration is, is that when I'm talking about godly character, I recognize that you pretty much know what that is. You know what good character is. We tested that last week, but I thought we'd start off with a test today. And don't worry, the real difficult thing has already happened. That was the fruit of the Spirit song. But here's a test, okay? When it comes to godly character, is godly character corrupt? Is it honest? Or is it shady? Now, if you don't know what shady is, that's slang from like the 1990s. Okay, so it basically means that somebody is being deceptive or they're not being fully truthful, that they're kind of sleazy, shady, okay? So uh, how many for number one? Godly character is corrupt. Any hands? Nobody. How about number two? Hands in the air if you think it's number two. Yeah, all right. How about shady? Anybody for shady? You like some shady? (laughs) Look at that, right? And the answer is, go ahead, Matt. You see that? That, that is like the extent of my graphic design abilities right there. <laughs> it's honesty, right? Of course it's honesty. And that was obvious when I asked you this question, wasn't it? Because we teach our kids to be honest. Because we, our teachers teach our kids to be honest. We all know that honesty is something that we need to have. So when we see a scripture like this, the Lord detests lying lips, none of us are like, really? He does? God doesn't like lying? Wow. I didn't know that before. Or he delights in those who tell the truth. You're like, oh, glad that somebody told me. You didn't need to come to church to know this because this is obvious, isn't it? Shake your head yes if this is obvious. So the question is, if being honest is so obvious, then why do we lie? Because earlier I asked how many of you struggled with lying, and I think most of you raised your hand, and the rest of you, you were lying when you didn't, you know what I mean, right? I mean, we all on some level struggle with lying, and, and I believe that as a, as a person of faith and as a church, we should be like the most transparent and honest people possible because we got this God of grace, and so it's okay to not be perfect. I know a lot of times church and church people are quite the opposite, but if it's so obvious To be honest, then why do we lie? We want to dig into this a little bit. And and what I'm going to attempt to do today is to kind of like pull back the curtain or to use a different metaphor, kind of lift the hood so we can kind of see what is behind our lying, what is behind the difficulty with being honest. And the way we're going to do that is we're we're going to look at a story from the beginning of the early church. It's a strange story, okay? I'm going to warn you about that, but I think it's a powerful story. And to to set up the story, I I just want to talk a little bit, kind of an overview of the beginnings of the early church. You all have heard of Jesus, I would imagine. He had a ministry that lasted three years, and it was a powerful ministry. People began to follow him, and they began to experience some transformation. And he taught about servant leadership. He taught about sacrificial love, and people were buying in, and this movement was growing. And then he was arrested. And he was put on a cross, the Roman instrument to kill movements. And the movement, in many ways, died. Not a single person continued to believe when Jesus went up on that cross. They all went underground. They all became stricken by fear. They all, in some sort of way, became cowards. Because a leader had just been brutally murdered. And then they start to pop up. And then they start to gather again. And we don't know exactly why the movement starts to pop up again, but what they tell us is that this man, Jesus, who was put upon a cross, that he not only died, but that he rose again. And they get together in Acts 2, which is a great day of Pentecost, and the Spirit of God comes down upon them, and it moves them powerfully. And they begin to speak in tongues in different languages, and it's such a chaotic, crazy scene that observers, they say that these guys must be drunk. And their response, their defense, get this, this is in the Bible, got to read it for yourself. They say, hey, it's only eight in the morning. Like, you know, we're not day drinkers. We're not having wine with our breakfast. 
you know, Bloody Marys haven't been invented yet. You know, we're not drunk. This is the Holy Spirit. And they start to go out and they begin to preach. Peter and John preach in the same places that Jesus preached to the same people that arrested Jesus. And Jane, uh, Peter and John, they get arrested by the same guys that arrested Jesus. And the other followers who had just kind of gotten their courage again, they must be thinking, here we go again. Jesus was arrested, and that killed the movement, or almost did, and now Peter and John, and the movement is again going to be over. But miraculously, Peter and John are released. And they come back together with the disciples, and they're praying together, and it's a wonderful prayer that ties in some Old Testament stuff. This is Acts 4 now. And then they pray for courage, and Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, Luke says the room shakes. There's so much power. There's so much emotion in the room. And it's there that, that we jump into this story. And Luke tells us, he says, all the believers... Believers in what? Believers in sacrificial love, believers in servant leadership, believers in the way that Jesus taught to live in the world. All these believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything. They thought that what they owned was not their own? What? How does that happen? Well, it happens for them the same way it might happen for you. You see, if you encounter the truth enough, you'll begin to realize that this life that you have that you think is your own is really on loan. Every single one of our lives come to an end. And therefore, all the things that you own that are your property that you think you're going to hold on to, at some point in time, you're going to take the same amount of that stuff with you as everybody else. And you know how much? Zero. Because if you really dig down into it, what you own is really just kind of on loan. And, and these guys learn that, and what it does is it opens up their hands. They're no longer holding on to everything. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. The assumption, it's all for my consumption. Instead, their hands are open, and they're able to begin to share with others. And look at what happens. Next slide. There were no needy people among them. Well, how do they afford that? Because those who own land and houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. There's no needy people among them. They realize what I own is not my own. It's, it's really on loan. And so they started to, hey, I got a little extra property. I got a little extra something, this. And they started selling it. And they were able to take care of all the needs. Now, isn't that amazing? Wouldn't it be something to be part of a community and there was nobody with need among us? So what was going on behind the scenes that would cause this to happen? And so this is kind of pulling back the curtain a little bit. I've been teaching about this idea for, for several weeks now. I think that if Jesus was to say, here's the basic dynamic that's happening for us, he would say that, that we're all on this quest to move from being selfish to selfless. That we all start off as babies, and as babies, we're inherently selfish. And that's okay. You're a baby, all right? But if you stay that way as an adult, that's a problem. And so we're trying to become selfless. Now, last week, the Apostle Paul, he talked about this dynamic, and he said that all of us have this issue. It is called sin. You can call it what you want, but there's something within us that is pulling us towards selfishness. And you know that's true. You've struggled with selfishness, haven't you? And the way that sin works is it works through lies. It says this, you'll be more happy if you just take care of yourself. At the end of the day, you're going to be happier if you just focus on yourself. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's, it, it's not a big deal. Just me, 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 me. And I think every single one of us, at least I know for myself, part of my internal dialogue are these little lies that are trying to drive me to be more selfish. Now, the good news is, is that inside of you, Paul would say, Jesus would say, that there's also this thing called the Spirit, God's Spirit. And the Spirit is trying to move you to become selfless. And the way that it does that is it exposes you to truth. Because isn't it true that when you're at your best, that's when you're being the, the most selfless? Isn't it true that when you're at your best, you're caring for others and the focus is not on you alone, but you're thinking about other people? You're thinking about your fiance, you're thinking about your, your husband, your wife, your friend, your neighbor. Isn't that you at your best? And isn't it true that the people we celebrate the most, the people that we remember are the selfless people? Isn't that true? And so behind the scenes, what's going on in this community is that these people are exposing themselves over and over again to the truth of God, and it's driving them to become more selfless. And it's memorable, and it's celebrated. 
So it's interesting that, that Luke's next move is it tells a specific example. He says, for instance, talking about all these people selling off property and that sort of thing. For instance, there was Joseph. You remember Joseph? Well, which one? Was it Jesus' dad or the guy with the, the bright coat? No, no, no. It's not that one. It was the one that was nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. I tell you, you start being selfless, you'll probably get a cool nickname. Who wouldn't want to be the one called son of encouragement? Like Barnabas, you remember him. He's such a great guy that he's encouraging everyone. He was from the tribe of Levi. He came from the island of Cyprus. Oh, yeah, Barnabas, I remember him. That guy is awesome. He's so selfless. Well, what did he do? He sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money to the apostles. Now, just going to pause here for a second. This is pretty interesting. He brought the money to the apostles. There was no strings attached. It wasn't designated donation. He just gave the money to the apostles because he trusted them enough to do with the money something that would be a blessing. And I just want to take for a moment and, and say, as a church, where we want to get to with each and every one of you is that you would trust us enough that we would have demonstrated our competency that we are doing good in the community enough that you would feel comfortable just saying, here's a check. I believe that you'll do the best with it. That's the goal for a church. And that's what was happening, that the apostles and leaders, they were blessing the community enough that people are just like, hey, I'm going to sell a field, and here you go. Just, just do what you do. I think that's always our goal. He sold a field, and he brought the money to the apostles, but there, but, which tells us there's another side of the story, but there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife, uh, Sapphira, sold some property. So they're like the same, right? They, these, you know, Barnabas and Ananias, Sapphira, no, not exactly the same. Because look what he did. He brought part of the money to the apostles. Oh, if we sell a field, we're, we're, we have to bring in all or nothing. Is that what Luke is trying to get at? No. Here's the problem. He brought part of the money, but he claimed it was the full amount. To which we think, oh my gosh, what did his wife think? She must have been so upset with him, right? With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. They're in collusion together. They sell some property. They bring part of the money. And both of them say, hey, this is the full amount. Now, why in the world would they do this? Why would they lie? Was it because they felt obligated to give it all? Is it because the disciples are constantly preaching and the apostles are preaching, you got to give it all, you better give everything? Is that the reason? Well, there's no evidence in the scripture for that. I don't think that's it. Was it they forgot how much he sold it for? Like, I mean, isn't that the excuse often that we give when we lie or we bend the truth? Oh, I just forgot, you know, hey, you know, I'm getting older, losing my brain, whatever, this sort of thing. Don't we say that? Even young people say that, by the way, okay? Well, I don't think he forgot because he's conspiring with his wife. So maybe was it that they wanted to appear selfless when they were actually acting selfish? Could that be it? Because I'll tell you, just speaking of myself, there's times when that pull on me to be selfish is pretty strong, but I still want to appear selfless. And so there's this desire in me to kind of put on a front, to put on a show, because everybody celebrates the selfless person. I know that. But there's still this pull, and so there's always this temptation. And I think that that's what happened here. It got the better of them. But they wanted to appear selfless while still being selfish. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? Which feels like a bit of an overstatement, doesn't it? I mean, come on, they sold this property and they gave part of the money to the church. Isn't that a good thing? Should we celebrate that? But Peter says, why have you let Satan fill your heart? Now, did you know that Jesus one time called Peter Satan? And all Peter did was he tried to stop Jesus from going to Jerusalem because he knew if Jesus went to Jerusalem, that they were going to murder Jesus, and he loved Jesus, and he wanted to keep Jesus safe. And plus, if we're really to be honest, Peter kind of had this plan about how things were to go, and you know, he liked being part of this movement. But Jesus called Peter Satan. And now Peter is calling Ananias Satan. And, and I think our disconnect maybe is, is this. When we think of Satan, we're conditioned by kind of like Hollywood horror films. We think of Satan as this like big beast and he's this big, dramatic, scary thing. But the scripture's vision of Satan and the way that Satan works in particular, is much more mundane. It's much more subtle. Satan would rather be in the shadows, be shady, be behind the scenes. Twist a little bit of truth, nudge you a little bit there, but that's really the way he works. And Peter understands that this little lie 
that this choice, it just opened up the door for something destructive. It says, you lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wish. You didn't have to sell the property. Nobody made you obligated to do that. And after selling, the money was also yours to give away. You didn't have to give any of the money to us. But you lied to us. And you began to break the relationship with us when you lied to us. You didn't have to lie. But when you did, you began to break the relationship with us. You began to to destroy your integrity. And you potentially introduced something toxic into our community. How could you do a thing like this? This is bigger than you thought. And then he gets straight to the point of the matter. He says, you weren't lying to us. You thought that you were lying to us. We would never know. We found out, and that's that. But the real problem here is you weren't lying to us. You were lying to God. God knew. You didn't have to. You didn't have to sell the property. You didn't have to bring the money, and you chose to do it, and that's a great thing. But you lied, and so you you, you tainted it all. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Now, I don't think that, like, Peter killed him. He was like, oh, and God's wrath come down on you, and then he dies. That's not what the story says. It just says he died. I don't know why. Perhaps he had a heart attack. Perhaps he he recognized the gravity of the situation, and he wanted so much to be a contributor to the church, and then he realizes that his desire to appear selfless while being selfish was so toxic that it just was too much, and he had a heart attack. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't tell us. But I do think of this scripture from Jesus, these words. He says, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? That it is possible for us to have material gain, to to have success in the eyes of others, yet at the same time lose our soul, our integrity, our sense of self. And that's what really matters. Because you can have all the riches in the world, You can have all the celebrity in the world. You can have all of that in the world, yet be miserable because you damage your soul. That's what is at stake here. About three hours later, his wife, Sapphira, not knowing what happened, she comes back. And Peter's like, so that money you guys gave, was that all of it? And she's like, yeah, yeah, that was all of it. And then Peter says, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like? I got a silly example to kind of explain why he would say this. So just bear with me, okay? I think this makes sense. It makes sense to me. So late at night, when my wife and kids are asleep, if I'm still awake, sometimes I'll eat some chips. Sometimes I'll finish the bag of chips. And I'm not talking about like one of those personal bags. I'm talking about like a family size bag of chips. Yeah, anybody, anybody with me on this? Okay. And, and, and most of the time, like, I clean up the evidence. I get out the dust buster. Because if you eat an entire bag of chips, there's crumbs all around you. Because that means you're, like, having a thing with those chips, right? And so I clean up the, 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 you know, and I hide the evidence. And I think I've gotten away with it. Nobody knows. Yet the next morning, my stomach always hurts. And over time, my body is becoming less and less healthy because of all the salt and fat and everything in that bag of chips, right? And so I could get away with it, but I never really get away with it. What I think Peter's trying to teach us, what, what Luke's trying to teach us in this, is that when we lie, we might get away with it in terms of the person that we're talking to might not know, but we never really get away with it because ultimately that deception, that lying, is damages our souls. What Peter says next is like, in my opinion, the most gangster line of the entire Bible, okay? So he says this, sir, the men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. You follow that? She doesn't even know that he's dead, okay, All right? And, and he's like, you lied to us, and how dare you think? And then, and then, you know, if this was like a mob movie, this line would fit in, I think. The young man who buried your husband, like, you're dead too. And instantly, she fell to the floor and died. And I don't think because 
Peter threatened her. I don't think that's what Peter was trying to do. He just understands how these things work, and he was laying out the consequence to her, and it overwhelmed her. She died. Now, this is a crazy story, and this is kind of how it ends, okay? Yay, Jesus, all love and all that. No, right? I mean, this is kind of a weird story. And so what's the point? Is it simply you lie, you die? Is that, is that what we're, yeah, like, and, and have a great lunch, you know, okay, yeah, see you next week. It's so encouraging at faith, right? Well, obviously not, because we all admitted that, you know, at various points in our lives, we lie. I mean, we struggle with this, and we're all still alive, at least for now. So it can't be this. On the other hand, in some ways, it is correct. Because don't relationships begin to die the moment you begin to lie? Your relationship with your spouse, with your kids, with your friends, with your fellow church members, when we start to lie, we, we are at least taking steps away from a healthy relationship. And when we start to lie, we are taking steps away from a healthy relationship with ourselves. It's damaging our integrity. It's damaging our souls. When we start to lie, we're taking steps away from a good relationship with God, one where we feel comfortable in his grace, where we can really depend on him, because for some reason we thought we had to keep some truth from God. The last person you should lie to is God, because he already knows. And he loves you anyways, accepts you anyways. So just one, one insight, and, and then we're done. I, as I was thinking about, you know, kind of what is going on here, I think that, that as simple as this, lying has a short-term benefit. It does. It often has a benefit. It's like, I don't have to deal with that awkwardness, or I got away with that. It has this short-term benefit. We should be honest about that. But it always has this long-term cost. And we get wrapped up in that short-term benefit. And then we find ourselves, some of us, we, we get wrapped up into a web of lies because we're telling one lie to, to protect the lie we told before and then that lie and that lie, right? Anybody ever been caught up in that? And that ends up having this terrible long-term cost because you can't keep up with your own lies. But it has a short-term benefit. Honesty, on the other hand, it often has a short-term cost. That person might be mad with you because you told them what you really thought or or you had to pay extra, or whatever it might be. You had to own that and apologize. It does have a short-term cost, but it does end up having this long-term benefit. Your soul is intact. When, when my grandfather passed away, my dad's dad, he was a, he was a farmer. Uh, by worldly standards, he was not a notable man. And there was a lot of people at his funeral, and this other kind of crusty old farmer guy gets up and he says about my grandfather that he was the most honest man he ever met. And it was at that moment that my dad began to cry. And I don't remember anything about that funeral other than that moment. Because it's the honesty that is remarkable, that is memorable. So be honest. So if honesty is so obvious, why do we lie? It's real simple. Here it is. We don't really understand the cost. We're not thinking about it in the right way. We're thinking about the short-term cost, but it's the long-term cost. It's the missed opportunity. That's why we're talking about be honest. Be honest. There's a long-term benefit. Whereas right? the scripture says, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in the truth. There's a long-term benefit. Be honest. Let us pray. God, I lift up each person here. And in all honesty, we all struggle with being honest. And so we ask for your help. We ask that you would help us continue to look at the right thing, look at this and our choices through the right frame. For Laura, there, there might be a short-term benefit to bending the truth, to twisting the truth, to appearing selfless even when we're selfish. But in the long run, it damages our relationships with others, with ourselves, and with you. And yes, indeed, you are a God of grace, and you love us no matter what. But Lord, it becomes harder and harder for us to receive your grace when we don't totally trust you. 
So help us to be honest. In Jesus Christ's name.